Today, uh, we're going to discuss a, a simple concept about being fulfilled. Uh, human beings are built to need fulfillment, they are built to seek fulfillment, and they are doing it. They will fulfill or find fulfillment any way they can. And here we are, inspired by God's holy day plan in His holy days, and we finished the entire season, and we returned to life. We left behind only to come back to find Satan desperately attacking our concentration on what is reality and attempting, in fact, actually, to tell us there's another reality. Maybe you haven't thought of it that way. He is trying to distract us, and he's very good at this, away from what's actually happening. And Satan is relentless in attempting to remove us from total concentration on real life in what God's family is designed to do. And as human beings, here's how we experience life. Through our senses, mainly. Sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch. We also have intellect and we have consciousness and we're aware of emotions and creativity. We're capable of comprehending that there's something beyond our physical experience. And we are able to comprehend that there is a God. Now, this is important. You'll see why I wanted to say this. Animals don't seem to have that kind of comprehension. Their mortality or of morality or of God, they are just alive. And interestingly enough, in the process of being created by God that way, if you think about this a minute, animals are actually created to not be credited with sin. They have no consciousness of sin. They're interdependent. All of nature, all of creation is interdependent. Isn't it? Okay. But humans, on the other hand, search for the answers to why are we here? Are we the only ones in the universe? Is there life after death? Can we communicate with the dead? What are spirits? Are there any such things as ghosts? See, look, science doesn't show us answers to those questions. It, it, it gives us insights into how the universe works, but not why it exists, and what's the purpose for each unique person. And the inability of science to deal with humanity's spiritual nature, while many times claiming that the Bible is a myth at the same time, is one of the reasons why tens of millions of people in our society are left floating in a, in a spiritual vacuum, grasping at whatever feels right to fulfill themselves. One of those country and western songs that uh, comes to mind is, it can't be wrong if it just feels so right. Yeah, it can. Yeah, it can. It can be very wrong. Whether a person seeks a spiritual fulfillment in an ornate cathedral, in a church, spiritual music, Sabbath service, Eastern meditation, we're all seeking the answer to the same question. Is there anyone to help us solve our problems and guide our life? Is God caring about me and my concerns? Or is God unfair to me? Now, I speak to myself and to all of us when we consider for a moment the kinds of questions that human beings ask themselves and the red flags as to why would they ask questions like, is God being unfair? Why am I suffering? Why can't I get better? Why am I not okay? Why are things not being the way they should be? So today we want to help acknowledge the spiritual need and desire that all of us have and look at the dangers of the spiritual experience that, sorry to say, aren't really sometimes centered on God. And every one of us have our own approach to being fulfilled. And some of those things that we use to be fulfilled are a real surprise to us when we find out, oh, I'm being fulfilled by being negative about things. No. Yes, I do. We all do. I'm feeling better if I express my anger over what's not good. Well, that's not from God. We'll examine today, and here's your title, Real Spiritual Fulfillment, or Real Living. Real spiritual fulfillment, real living. 
And what do we mean by spiritual experiences that aren't centered on God and in the way he wants us to experience him? Well, all right, let's ask ourselves a simple question. Pretty simple, but you can answer too. How does Satan see the world and God? If we find ourselves looking at the world and God, or the world or God, at all like Satan, you got to wonder where that's coming from. And then the other question is, how does God see the ongoing creation he's making? Right now, here. See how you feel about this. This is up for discussion, I guess. Is there more evil than good? Is there more corruption than order? Is there more death than life? Do we, you and I, fit into Colossians 3, 1 through 4? You don't have to turn there. I'll tell you what it says. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says this. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. We only have two thoughts today. Very simple. And when we're done with this, there is a method of how to not only evaluate ourselves as to whether we're seeing the world and God a little bit like Satan. And if we are, what do we do about it? There are methods that are biblically applicable, given to us as his children. Our first thought then is, we are designed, we are built, we are created to have a relationship with God. Let's turn over to Psalm 40, the 40th Psalm where David is discussing his relationship with God, which is very different from most people. Every human being is designed to have a relationship with God. He built us this way. It's, it's a deep spiritual need. It's a desire. And David, in many of the Psalms, wrote about this intense need and desire for God. Now, if we say, I need God and I, and I, and, and I need him added to me, it may be, again, a red flag. We don't need God added to us. We need God, period. Period. Psalm 40, let's start there. Verse 1. Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited, this is how David discusses his life. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me. And he heard my cry, and he also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see and hear and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Now hold on. He's saying there's more thoughts from God than there are other things. Remember we asked the questions, are, are there, is there more order or more corruption? Is there more death or more life? Is there more good or more hate? If we look at the world, we say, well, there's got to be all this bad. There's nothing good. We'll get to this. The short answer is, there's very little corruption, very little death, and very little hate compared to the wonder of what God's doing. And we'll see how to know when we fall into this trap of looking at the world and God like Satan does. Go on down here to verse 11, Psalm 40, verse 11. Do not hold, do not withhold, in verse 11, do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord, let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. He's not talking about being preserved by his armies 
or his subjects or his position as king of Israel. He wants God to do it. He isn't adding God to himself. He is relying on God for life itself. Verse 12, For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me, so I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head, therefore my heart fails me. So this is his position, his state. But overall, how much evil is there? Well, he is overwhelmed by it. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me, O Lord. Make haste to help me. What? That makes no sense. If he's overwhelmed by evil, how can the Lord help him? There has to be more good than evil. That's how. Go down to verse 16. Down to verse 16 now. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as your love and your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy. No, he wasn't. Not in human terms. But he said, as far as he's concerned, he's poor and needy spiritually. Yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. That's the one who had a heart after God. When human beings are not in a spiritual connection with God, they, they search to find fulfillment in ways they are not centered on God. And that's not good. It's important for Christians to remember this. We also, when we're not in spiritual contact with God, can search for spiritual fulfillment in ways that are not centered on God. We'll start giving you examples here in a little bit, but let's at least get that concept so that we can accept. I don't want to be cute here, but at least accept that somebody else might do this. They might get centered on the wrong thing instead of on God. If a human being can do it, if a human being can be centered on the wrong thing, even in the church, so can you. So can I. To understand how this happens, we have to first remember something that's easy for us to forget or minimize as unimportant. And we know from Scripture that God created spirit beings. They're called angels or messengers. And they have appeared to people to bring messages from God. That's called a theophany. These beings were created for good. But they also had self-will. So let's turn to Ezekiel 28 where we know We've been before, Ezekiel 28, and it, there's a little Bible lesson here in how to read Ezekiel 28, but we're going to look at the origins of Satan and the demons. And this world is what humanity knows, this world that we're going to look at here, okay? Ezekiel 28 starts out with prophecies about the prince and also king of Tyre, two different beings. The prince of Tyre? The king of Tyre. Ezekiel 28, verse 1, start there. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince, notice that, prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up. Your heart is lifted up. The very inside of you is lifted up. And you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Now, no human being would ever do that. All right? Let's start here. How can that idiot drive like that? How can somebody be so stupid as to not think this way? We're putting our position as a critic of God's creation. Is that our job? Ezekiel 28, verse 6. Ezekiel 28, verse 6. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers among you, the most terrible of the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor, and they will throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Now, see, all of Ezekiel 28 isn't about Satan or Lucifer. 
the subject changes here from the prince to the king of Tyre. So there's a king and there's a prince. So the prince is the human being. The king is somebody else. The king is not human. He was in Eden, anointed cherub on the throne of God. This cherub, which is a class of angels, as you know, sinned against God, was removed from a special relationship with God. He became known as the adversary of God or Satan. And consider, he's the adversary of God who criticizes God as being unfair, unjust, not wise, and removed from us. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, king, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. Now, you're not saying that about a human. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Certainly not a human. You were in Eden. Definitely not a human. The garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald, gold. The worksmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed caribou covers. I established you. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And he criticizes God and God's creations. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. You sinned, therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. O covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stones, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, and I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Let me tell you about me. Because if I tell you about me, then maybe you can accept this. There were years as I approached being in my profession, 50 years. There were years as I was coming up on that time where sometimes we have people were counseling and counseling, you know, in, in the marketing and television world that literally are hiring you because they don't know what they're doing. And they'll tell you, well, here's how I do it. And I'd made a mistake multiple times. I would say, well, I've been at this four decades. I've been at this five decades. And I'll tell you, here's what I've learned that doesn't work. And what you're saying probably won't work. Why is that a bad thing? Because people don't want to hear that. I have more experience than you. It doesn't make you right. I have a degree. I've done this before. It won't work. We're not as old as Satan. Where does that stuff come from? He knows how this all works. And he puts that in our head. And we fall for it. How can anybody be so stupid as to not think like me? How can I be fulfilled more by thinking of myself so highly? This happens. And it's very bad for us. Now it goes further. Pagan religions like Hinduism or Buddhism or even the grandeur of a Christian cathedral can create the feeling of a spiritual connection, and, and, and Satan does that. This kind of spirit experience is actually Satan's way of turning people away from the true God. And by the way, that can happen in the church, where this fellowshipping and experience of the truth can cause us to think, that's good, that's creation, that is my new life. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, because what Paul's doing is he's simply saying, there's some standards, just, just understand, there's real simple standards. I want you to know what they are, and it's like, doctor, it hurts when I do this. What does the doctor say? Don't do that. Here's what Paul's doing. They needed to be told, don't do that. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. What's idolatry? Making anything God instead of God. And by the way, that includes us. If we make ourselves God, that's idolatry. I speak as to wise men, 
Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? What does he mean by that? Communion, communion with becoming one with. That's what it means. Joining with, being of, being existing due to the relationship. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we partake of that one bread. So all of us in the church are of God. So there should be absolutely no division there. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God, and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Okay, now that settles it. Whatever we think we're doing that's right, there has to be a measurement. Is this of really of God, or is this of the one who criticizes God? See, there's a lure, isn't there, of the mysterious. What we don't know, we're interested in. There was a group of guys who were listening to Paul on Mars Hill, and he's saying, I'm going to tell you about the unknown God. Half of them said, we don't want to hear about this anymore. Get out of here. The other half said, we will continue to learn more. We're always interested in new things. They weren't interested in conversion. They just wanted to know more stuff. Have any of us ever done that? It's important to remember, every human being is spiritually incomplete. We're all spiritually lost. We're all dying in need of healing. We're not just dying of COVID. We're not just dying of old age. We're not just dying because we're running down. We're dying in need of healing from God spiritually. It's a spiritual need. We feel it. We know it. It motivates human beings to try and discover meaning in the mysteries of personal fulfillments. Colossians 2. We were in Colossians 2 earlier with Mr. Flamen. Let's go back. Colossians 2, verse 1. Let's just go there. He, all right, first of all, about Colossians. Colossians is a letter that was to be read in Laodicea. What? Well, it's a letter to Laodicea, too. In other words, the attitude of Laodicea is addressed in Colossians. Colossians 2, verse 1. Colossians 2, 1, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, they should be, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God. Well, oh, well, then mysteries are good, both of the Father and of Christ, in, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. These mysteries are held from humanity. They aren't the mysteries of spiritism. They're the mysteries that are withheld from those who are not chosen by God. And this spiritual connection with God is made possible through the work of Jesus Christ. So we are to walk with Him. That's what he's saying. Christianity is being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, an imitator of Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual way of life and a sacrificing way of life. Verse 4. Keep going. Verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith. This is trust in God over self. Your steadfastness of your faith due to Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk with Him, completely, totally relying on Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the trust of Him, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Now, without going down there to verse 20, it talks about in verse 20 of Colossians 2, the basic principles of the world. I actually gave a message on the basic principles of the world about a year ago. These basic principles of the world are non-God-centered approaches to spirituality. That's the way the world thinks, because it's got a God who tells it how to think. The basic principles of the world run by 
the one who criticizes God. It's a non-God-centered approach to spirituality, and it can cause the same words and use the same words as the Bible. Love and mercy and Jesus and all leads to false spirituality. Verse 8, go down to verse 8 now. Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. Okay. So now we understand that there is a basic need, a basic need. It's built in. It's created. Why would God do that? So we'll grope for Him and find Him. And He says, I'm, I'm not that far away, but I hope for you to grope for me and find me. So He's built into us the desire to be fulfilled by Him. That's our first thought. There's a second one. True spirituality. True fulfillment spiritually is centered on God, not on ourself, not on doctrine. It is No, really, it's not on any human interpretation of experience, but it's from God's Spirit and His Word. And it's centered on God and in a way He wants us to experience Him. And this mystery, go to Romans 5, we'll go to Romans 5, this mystery of this relationship that is revealed due to Jesus Christ, because He opens it up to us. Who He is, His physical life, His death, His resurrection, as Mr. Flamen talked about. He is our example. He is our one to follow. The example of a spiritual relationship with God. How did He relate to God? Uh, he prayed. He never stopped. He trusted God was good, not Him. While he was surrounded with the hate of humanity, officially rejected by the government and religions of this world, being murdered, spit on, called names, and rejected officially, he trusted God with two things. First, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And second, Unto you I commend my spirit. That doesn't sound like somebody who doesn't trust him or thinks God's unfair. Even though it could be said he was unfairly tried and unfairly murdered, he knew why he was doing that. And he obeyed to the end, even unto the death on the cross. He's our example of a spiritual relationship. The problem is that even with that knowledge, with that understanding, we can't create that connect with God on our own. We can't. Romans 1, Ro excuse me, Romans 5, Romans 5. Start right away in the beginning of Romans 5. Paul makes statements, wonderful benefits of coming in from a spiritual connection with God like justification, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access to His grace. We can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. All of those things are what you get. But why would you get that? Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 5, verse 1. We have peace with God through, or because of, our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have access by faith, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in the tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. Let's go back. Verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulations produce perseverance. So there's a benefit to things not going right. Perseverance produces character. And character, hope. We move forward. In the end, our hope will not disappoint because God's gift of His Holy Spirit sees to it that our reasoning is overridden by God's mind. Romans 5, verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint. 
Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. See, there's an answer to the great spiritual mystery that is our spiritual void that can only be filled through the relationship with God as our Father. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to take the penalty of our sins on Himself and to make spiritual healing possible. So when we feel ill, imagine how we actually are spiritually. Way worse. We're in the process of dying spiritually. The healing is carried out in our lives by God, the Father, and Christ living in us through the Holy Spirit. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the only way our spiritual need and desire can be fulfilled. We can't make up a way to feel better about life. We can't make up a God. We can't make up a religion. We can't make up a history of knowledge or experience. We can't say we're better than others. None of that works. Without this relationship with God, human beings are manipulated. They're, Satan hates God. He rejects God. He, he, he wants God gone. He wants us gone with Him. Without this relationship with God, human beings are manipulated to seek spiritual connection through other things. Like, how about this? Ingratitude. God's unfair. I don't have fill in the blank. He's unfair. Where can we find any history of a spirit being who said God's unfair? Iniquity was found in him. How about this? Spiritism. What else is there besides the church, beside the truth? What else is there? Maybe there's something else that they're not telling me. How about this? Always learning new things and new knowledge. I am so fulfilled. I know so much I didn't know before. So what? We don't know anything compared to God. Frankly, we don't know anything compared to Satan. We have to choose who we're going to follow. How about this one? Self-elevation. Do you know there are self-help books to be self-improvement people that leave you to the place at the end of these books that lead you down the road of saying you are your own Messiah. You can manipulate the physical universe. You can manipulate the thoughts of others. You become self-elevated to become your own Messiah. Oh, you're making that up. Nope. Self-help. How about religious emotion as entertainment? I like going to church because I sure do like that relief from the entertainment of the world. Ask yourself what you're doing. Considering that there is more corruption than order, more death than life, more evil than good, more hate than love, that's of Satan. He wants you to see, he wants me to say, the world is negative. The problem is, that's a lie. Because God's in charge. Every molecule is in order. Every, every drop of water, every part of the earth, everything is in order. There are more people alive today and more people being born today than are dying. How do we know that? The population is exploding. So there's more life than death. There's more order than corruption. And is there more good than evil? There better be because everything is still here and it's not being upheld by Satan. If we miss that God's in charge and His creation design is amazingly powerful, we, when we miss that, we focus on an imagined reality, not God's truth. So we're not being fulfilled by God, but we're being filled by another. How real is God as opposed to the world and its negative approach to reality? All right. Luke 19. 
Let's just go to Luke 19 first, because it's a good place to start. Now take a look at uh, method here. Just a simple method. I didn't go over a little bit because we went a little long on the sermonette and the announcements were involved, so we'll go a little bit long. Um, if you need to leave, I guess. I don't know where you're going, but anyway. <laughs> we're going to have fellowship afterwards, so I hope you'll stay. If you, if you look at what is happening here in Luke 19, it's very easy to say, well, we're going to read something that's, that obviously is just figurative. It's not literal. Because human beings experience this through their five senses. And what we're about to read couldn't possibly be real, so it's just poetry. The Messiah is entering Jerusalem. Watch this. Luke 19, verse 37. Luke 19, 37. Then, as he is, was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, things that they had never seen before. People raised from the dead, for one. Verse 38, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Don't let them talk like that. That's against normal human understanding. Verse 40. But he answered and he said to them, I tell you, that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now we have a question here. Is that poetry? Or is that literal? This is the person who walked on water. This is the person who said to Israel, stand still and watch the power of the Lord, and the Red Sea opened. If these people were to be silent, these stones would immediately cry out, this is the Messiah entering Jerusalem. Who would say that isn't real? Who would, who would say that? Where would we get an idea like that? 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Now, let's review. We know Satan is the god of this world. He tells us all how to live, unless we don't listen to him. But he's the god of this world. He owns it. He runs it. God has put him here with his demons on this earth, and they run this planet. Right? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 26. How negative are we? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 26. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. So Satan doesn't own the earth? No. It's the setting for God's family. It was created through Jesus Christ, and there's nothing that was created that wasn't created by Him. It's His. By the way, if you have a deed to land, it's on loan, just like our land here. It doesn't belong to us. This earth isn't ours. And it isn't Satan's either. So who's in charge here? John 1. John 1. Oh, I know where you're going now. Yeah, let's go there. John 1, verse 1. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Well, he owns everything. He owns all its fullness. But he's not managing it, is he? Because look how evil and corrupt the earth is. He's not managing it. He owns it, but he's left it to Satan. Hebrews 1. 
Hebrews 1. We have been lied to, and we've listened to the lie. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3. The most important thing is the horrible governments and the great plagues and the awful way people treat each other and the laws of abortion. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of his majesty on high. He owns it, he created it, and he runs it. Satan doesn't own it, Satan didn't create it, and Satan doesn't run it. We're going somewhere with this. Remember we talked about the fact that once we figure out that we have believed the lie, that we have fallen into being fulfilled by negativism, and you know that happens, once we've fallen into that, and this is really easy now after we come back from the feast and all this is going on. What? Why is this happening to me? I want you to think about something. Go to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. I want you to think about something. We're going to look at the method, how, how to deal with this. What to do. But it's hidden. God's people will see it, but it's hidden here. And the reason it's hidden is the way Paul thinks. Paul, being a Jew, actually a Benjamite, and a Pharisee, is used to the idea of making thought and teaching sometimes idiomatic. Is there more negativism, more corruption than order? Is there more love than hate? Is there more life than death? Of course! It's not hopeless. It's not over. Satan loses. Now, how do we remember that? There's a method. But it's hidden in the way it's written. Watch this. Philippians 4, verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6. Oh, that thing. Uh-huh. That thing. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Whoa, 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 whoa. Be anxious for nothing? Yeah, but i got to be afraid of things. Nope. Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, not ingratitude, but thanksgiving, thanks for this day that we have. Let your requests be made known to God, then it's in His hands. And verse 7, here we go. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Human beings can't figure this out. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren. Now look how he writes this. Whatever things are true, there's not all just Tiny, tiny things. There aren't that many. Just little tiny things are true. Little, oh, it's hard to find. There's almost no truth. See how he's writing? It's an idiom. Whatever things are true. Everything is true except the lies from Satan. All the order, all the life, all of the good. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, there's almost nothing noble. Yes, there is. Whatever things are just, is there justice? Yeah. Whatever things are pure, is there actually purity? The Holy Spirit, for sure, that runs the universe. Whatever things are lovely, does God make anything perfect and good and beautiful? Look at nature. Whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate. Sink your teeth into these things. What happens when you do that? Suddenly, the negativism melts because there's peace beyond all understanding and you'll be anxious for nothing. This is how it works. 
there it is, hidden from the world because we make fun of it. Is there, is there anything about Paul's life that would seem to have been negative? Beaten, jailed, shipwrecked, killed, a bondservant of God? Is there anything negative, unfair? And look how he's talking. Okay. These misunderstood and ignored realities can, can cause false manipulation by Satan if we don't listen. The demons will draw human beings away from God with negativism. They're manifested in today's society in a new age movement, the law of attraction, the secret. Some literature even leads humanity to actually believe they're in control of their own future. They can manipulate time. All right. God enlightened the Christian mind. And because he did, seldom does Satan attack head on. Instead, he's the prince of the power of the air. He manipulates us through emotions like anger and greed and pride, hurt feelings, jealousy, feelings of loneliness. One of the main reasons given for committing adultery isn't because I was filled with lust, but because my spouse didn't understand me. In other words, there's self-justification involved, self-elevation. In these kinds of emotions, Satan manipulates so that we forget our need and desire for God. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. There's a mystery here, spoken of again. Mystery of true spirituality. Ephesians 2, verse 4. Actually, you know, when you think about this, this is uh, kind of a graduate course, if you will, in getting to the place where someone's liable to look at you and go, how can you survive? How can you be so positive? How can you be so caring in the midst of all of this chaos? What's the hope that lies in you? Have you ever wondered why someone would ask you that? It's because of what we just went through. Ephesians 2, verse 4. God, but God, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love, with which He loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. When we're connected to God through His Spirit. He creates good works in us. If, look at Ephesians 2, verse 10. Go to the next verse. For we are His worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We have to guard our minds, our spirit, our heart, our soul, that is to be God's. Our very will isn't ours. It's God's now. And we have to guard that against any form of spiritism that's not centered on God in the way of He wants us to be experiencing Him. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves focused on imagined negative side of life. We've been called to come out of confusion. We've been called to know God as Father and Jesus as Elder Brother and worship in spirit and truth. Now we're going to end here. Let's go to Ephesians 11. Excuse me, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. See, if we focus on satanic results of thought, the way he thinks of God and the way he thinks of the world, rather than the very good eternal life-sharing way of God's design for humanity, it's going to lead us down the wrong path. And we have, in our own minds, the right to be negative. On the other hand, God gave us this day, and maybe we don't get tomorrow. And that kind of negativism, why am I being treated like this? Or why are those people treating me like that? Or why isn't this working out the way I want? That kind of negativism isn't in the kingdom. It's not there. When you look, and I look, at what people are like who made it, there's no negativism at all. And there should be. Hebrews 11, verse 32. This isn't small thinking. Not like humanity. There's nothing about humanity thinking in here at all. This is big, eternal, life-sharing thinking. 
This is all about being forever part of what God's doing. Hebrews 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say, verse 32, what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms. What? Worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong because valiant in battle, turned to fight, flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. There's no human thinking here. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all these having obtained a good testimony through trusting God no matter what negative thing happened to them, did not receive the promised God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight. Lay it aside. Forget that stuff. And the sin which so easily ensnares us of thinking God is unfair and God isn't taking care of me and God's distant. He's not. And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Two thoughts, just two. We are designed to have a relationship with God, and true spirituality is centered on God and the way He wants us to experience Him. We are of God's given faith and God's given promises of faith. That is reality. That is real, spiritual fulfillment. And that's the only place it is. It's real life.